You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shravasa Prakash. This episode of Market Champions is brought to you by Simplify ETFs. For more information, visit simplify.us. No simplified funds will be discussed during this podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today, I've got the pleasure of speaking to Michael Cow, who is the founder um, and manager of Akantha's Capital Management. And um, you can find him on Twitter as well. Uh, I think it's at Cowboy Musings, right? So, sorry, at, at Urban, Urban Cow- Cowboy. <laughs> at Urban Cowboy. And then your blog is at Cowboy Musings, right? So, although, I, yeah, the blog, the blog isn't uh, kept up to date these days. I'm pretty much uh, in the Twitter sphere. <laughs> awesome. So, Mike, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It is awesome to thank uh, you. So, Mike, could you just give the audience a little bit about your background, you know, your journey in financial markets and, you know, how you got to where you are today? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, my, my route was uh, kind of uh, serendipitous. I studied electrical engineering and computer science in college. I wanted to be a video game designer. Um, <clears throat> and then when I got to uh, Cal, um, I quickly realized that um, once something that I enjoyed as a hobby uh, became a, a, a total bear to do, to, to actually execute from a, from a, like a homework and, you know, uh, test standpoint, it took a lot of the joy out of it. And so I was kind of thinking, you know, maybe I want to, do something else. This is probably right around like my senior year. And um, I met my uh, girlfriend and wife who was working uh, at Bear Stearns. And I think um, I, we, we, we talked about how, yeah, you know, the, the current um, top paid salaries for programmers back then, this is like right around 1992, um, were for people going to Microsoft, for instance, you know, getting paid, you know, forty five thousand dollars. Yeah, yep. and you know, she made an offhanded comment that, uh, oh yeah, my bosses make that in like a month. And so I'm like, wait a sec, what um, what business is that? And so I literally got introduced to the world of finance. I'm like, okay, I know nothing about stocks and bonds. I didn't even know what the Dow Jones industrial average was. So, um, you know, I started interviewing for uh, positions with investment banks, not knowing anything about, I didn't know that there were things like two-year analyst programs and whatnot, but um, I consulted with a couple of my friends and they said, oh yeah, you know, they're, you know, the, um, I said, you know, who's, who's, what's this company, Goldman Sachs, what's this company, Morgan Stanley, you know, that are recruiting on campus. And by the way, the, the types of recruiting ads that I saw were in, it were for IT, but these banks were recruiting in the IT department as well. Yep. So I want, long story short, I wound up getting um, a job at Goldman Sachs in New York originally in their IT department. And, um, you know, at the end of their uh, training program, they, it's almost kind of like a little draft pick. They, you know, they, they uh, rank you based upon, you know, your, your final sort of test results, and then you get picked and drafted into different departments. And Mm -hmm. I got uh, picked by the J Aaron group, which was the commodity uh, commodities and currencies area. Um, I started there originally programming and designing the the uh, op- the options trading interfaces uh, for the currency options group, and um, then there was a this was kind of an interesting day, like right around 1993, early 1993, right after 
um, Soros made his big name in the British pound market, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember him calling up the desk asking for a massive two-sided market on an options trade in dollar mark. And I happened to be on the trading desk at the time debugging uh, my newly released options module, right? And I was um, just asking, you know, the senior salesperson, can you explain to me the mechanics of this trade? And, you know, like you from, you know, at that point, Point, I had become very, very interested in um, the financial markets. I realized that, you know, if I wanted to be a, a computer programmer, uh, I probably should have gone to Microsoft. But if I'm going to be at Goldman Sachs, I'd rather, um, you know, learn about how it is that Goldman Sachs makes money for uh, its investors. Yep. So I wanted, to, I wanted to find some way of breaking into, you know, the, the trading uh, aspect of things. So I just studied a lot of on my own. And so I asked the sales guy, so can you explain to me this, this option strategy that Soros is looking for a two-sided market on? And, you know, they explained it to me on a, on a back of a napkin. He got it wrong. I corrected him without, you know, thinking much of the uh, conversation. And then uh, I think like two, two days later, I get a call at my cubicle back in IT from my boss's boss's boss. And he says, oh, yeah, so I hear you have a, a knack for options. Would you like to interview for a job um, as an analyst on the commodity side of things? So that's literally how I made the switch. And I never looked back. I've been in uh, finance ever since. So. <laughs> and so, so, so you were basically... Uh, so you, you start off in IT and then you moved on to, well, you know, what would be trim, you know, I guess macro and how did you find your way to Canyon? And then more importantly, how did you find your way to becoming some sort of a value investor who focused on the more of special situation and cap structure arbitrage sort of opportunities? So um, yeah, great. A good question. So, so when I joined Goldman, you're right. I, my focus was very much on macro. I joined a desk that was trading the then nascent GSCI, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. And it was mm -hmm. a you know, brand new product. And you know, I, was, I learned all my trading chops there, you know, learned to be a market maker, um, learned to arbitrage the index against 22 underlying commodities, learned to analyze you know, macro trends, et cetera. So it was basically breathing, eating, sleeping, everything commodity related and macro and technical analysis, that type of stuff. But um, to me, I never really got a fundamental background in finance. And I always felt uh, insecure about having that, that gap. And so I decided at the end of two years, even though I had already been pro you know, promoted to sort of associate level, which is typically the, you know, the post MBA position, I decided to, to, uh, to leave and just go to business school anyways and, and get that training. So that's what I did. And um, during uh, business school, um, I had a very impactful internship um, at the Harvard Management Endowment. And um, back, back then, this is right around 1996, the Harvard Endowment was still being run by Jack Meyer. Um, and... Uh, you know, they had a very interesting approach to to things. They, you know, they he Jack Meyer under Jack Meyer's um, uh, oversight, the Harvard Endowment had just had had made unbelievable returns, and they were do, doing it through a sort of relative value approach across different asset classes. So, you know, they had they were doing convertible arbitrage, they were doing merger arbitrage, they were doing fundamental equity long short. And so all of a sudden I'm like, wow, you know, there, there's so much more to, you know, uh, investing than just looking at macro and, 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 uh, and commodities. So I took a keen interest in, in um, some of the relative value um, strategies like, you know, merger arbitrage, convertible arbitrage and um, coming out of business school you know, that, you know, this is, again, I graduated business school in 1997. Hedge funds weren't really like a big thing. They certainly weren't 
you know, recruiting on campus, you know, pretty much like 99% of my business school classmates were going into either banking or consulting. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, I think I was probably the only one in my class at that time looking for a job in the, in the hedge fund space. And um, I wound up uh, and that's how I wound up uh, going to Canyon. Um, Canyon also is, you know, based in LA. I wanted to be back in LA. Um, Canyon was uh, started by two very smart gentlemen coming out of Drexel, um, very heavily steeped in, in uh, credit. Um, and so Canyon was very interesting to me because, you know, the I had a couple other job offers from more arbitrage centric hedge funds like Citadel and HBK. Um, and I guess you know, you could argue that based on my my background, I was he- more heavily steeped in you know options and and ARB. Yep, yep. Those places would have been a better fit for me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but Canyon was actually the most exciting in that you know, a, a um, I didn't know anything about credit analysis or you know capital structure, and B um, at Canyon uh, they didn't really at that point they didn't really focus um that much outside of directional credit investing so um when i uh went to canyon in early 97 um you know i probably spent the first year or so trying to just figure things out and learn uh credit analysis um you know analyze capital structures but um probably it wasn't until around 1998 literally on the eve of the Russian crisis that I started looking at some of these busted convertible bonds. And I can tell you some really interesting stories because, you know, back then, um, you know, Amazon's uh, had just issued one of their first convertible bonds. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Amazon was kind of like an unknown credit hemorrhaging cash. And I remember building a big position in the Amazon converts you know, uh, partially hedged with stock. And these converts traded as low as like, I think, 40 cents on the dollar. I mean, it was, wow. you know, there, there, were, there were some real questions as to what their long-term credit worthiness uh, was going to be. But anyways, that's a digression. We can talk about that later. But long story short, I started getting involved in credit sensitive convertibles, right? And I, I wound up, um, you know, coming up with this idea that i put together in a sort of internal paper. It was entitled Alpha with Asymmetry. And my, my idea was this, that you know, certain strategies like convertible arbitrage, uh, which entail buying the convertibles, shorting the stock, dynamically hedging, right? Mm-hmm. Are inherently long gamma strategies, right? So you, know, you, don't, you don't require a greater fool to determine an exit. So, so as long as you're buying the security cheaply enough, you can create a, you know, dynamically replicate the portfolio uh, and dynamically hedge, hedge the position and extract value that way. So that's a long, inherently long gamma strategy. On the other hand, um, again, going back to around the 1998 period of time, you know, a risk arbitrage or merger arbitrage, um, a lot of spreads had blown out on on deals, especially in the aftermath of uh, LTCM, right? Who was basically levering uh, a lot of merger arb strategies. So I started also building a portfolio in some of these strategies. And, but my observation of merger arb as from a systemic risk standpoint is that it's inherently kind of a short ball or short gamma strategy, because if you think about it um, in a typical friendly deal, right? you might have a 95% likelihood of making a dollar upon deal closure. Mm -hmm. But in that 5% likelihood of a deal bust, you might lose 10, right? So it's all about really picking, having a diversified portfolio of them and, and, and doing heavy due diligence on the individual deals. But my idea was, well, why not, in addition to doing that, overlay that on a portfolio of convert ARBs that, benefit from a high vol, high gamma, long gamma type of uh, approach. 
So uh, that was the framework that I espoused and I pitched uh, to the partners of Canyon. Uh, they let me have the ball and run with it. And over the next several years, I, I built that into a business within a business, which was then um, uh, we, we started a standalone fund around that strategy. And eventually, when I left uh, Canyon to kind of strike out on my own in 2002 to start Acanthos, uh, it was I, I basically uh, initially adopted that very, very similar approach. Um, <clears throat> and so the segue from that initial sort of multi-arbitrage approach to, uh, you know, what you call sort of val a value investing type of approach Yep. just happened happened naturally, right? Because if mm -hmm. you think about it, initially I was very, very <clears throat> convertible centric. Most of my uh, strategies had a convertible position as sort of the linchpin, and then I would build hedges around them, whether they are short stock hedges or short bond hedges or short or long option positions around it. But by by using the convertible as the linchpin of many of my trade constructions, it forces you to wear many hats, right? You have to understand equity valuation. You have to understand credit valuation. You have to understand the continuum of securities within a capital stru structure and recognize that it is just a continuum, right? And you also have to understand option valuation. So it forces you to really have a holistic approach in looking at the capital structure. Um, and, then, and then eventually um, when the financial crisis hit and post-financial crisis, um, a lot of you know, the risk reward in, in more arbitrage related trades, especially because the, uh, there was a big retrenchment of margin ability right, mm -hmm. from the banks post-GFC. Um, uh, that was factor number one. Factor number two was that, you know, there was so much distressed debt at that point that it no longer really made a lot of sense to pursue these ARBs when you could, you, you know, you could basically just identify very, very asymmetric fulcrum securities within the capital structure. So, it, it was sort of the combination of those two factors that made us more uh, shed more of our traditional arbitrage types of trades post GFC and focus on being more of like a, a deep distress type of player. But, but, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is over the close to 17 years that I ran um, Acanthos, um, we were very uh, opportunistic because, you know, you know it post, you know, Pre-GFC, we were more ARB-centric. Post-GFC, we became very, very um, distressed-focused, but then returned back to our arbitrage when it became very, very uh, attractive again around the 2010 timeframe, and then uh, migrated uh, to becoming more um, equity-centric at a certain point when, when you know, credit markets became fully valued. So we were very opportunistic in going up and down the capital structure. Got it, got it, got it. And, you know, one thing that, you know, you were talking about was concept of a fall from security. So could you actually explain, number one, how these cap structure arbitrage trades work and how the fall from securities, uh, you know, fit in you know, to that process? Yeah, so the way I define a, you know, so, so you think about a fulcrum, right? The fulcrum is that point on a seesaw that is, that has the high, that has the most leverage, right? Mm -hmm. So what I define to be a fulcrum security is that point in the capital structure where even a minimal change in the overall enterprise value can result in a massive change in the, in the particular securities value, right? So, so depending on how levered a company is, that fulcrum could be the equity or the fulcrum could be a piece of preferred or it could even be senior debt if it's a very, very levered company. So um, I can give you a, a very, very interesting uh, trade example uh, if you'd like. Absolutely. So, okay, so, so this is probably going right back to GFC. So. Pre-GFC, 
you may remember um, a company called General Growth Properties. It was at that time it was the second largest real estate um, uh, REIT. Mm-hmm. Sorry, the the second largest shopping mall REIT uh, in the U- U.S. Right, very levered. Um, if memory serves, they had something like twenty five billion of senior secured debt, and they had issued I think like a billion and a half worth of unsecured convertibles. And then, you know, then, then you have the equity market cap underneath, right? Well, they were, I had a small convertible ARB position on it where I was just long that convert, short the underlying stock, the convertible was cheap. But um, I can't remember the exact timing, but probably around 2007 when, you know, cracks started already appearing in, in the uh, cre- uh, you know, credit markets post Bear Stearns. Um, these, you know, the equity for these highly levered companies started, you know, getting slammed and the converts became busted and, you know, busted is a technical term, right? For converts, meaning out of the money, right? Way out of the money with respect to its conversion price. So, so I had, so we had, we had been reducing our position because one of the problems with, um, trying to hedge a busted convertible bond is that unlike, an option strategy where you don't have you don't have to worry about the credit quality, right? When you're dynamically hedging an option with a convertible bond, as the bond gets more and more out of the as the convertible bond gets more and more out of the money with respect to its conversion price, it takes on characteristics of a distressed bond. Which, um, if you've read some of my musings about this, right, a, a bond is kind of like being a short a put on the company's assets, right? So you, you begin to start taking on almost like negative gamma characteristics as a company starts approaching financial distress. So in GGP's case, as I was well uh, aware of that possibility, so we were reducing our convert ARB position as, mm-hmm. as the um, convert became more and more busted, right? Well, fast forward to September of 09, right? During like one week after Fannie and Freddie uh, got put into conservatorship, the reverberations in the, in the credit markets were crazy, right? So Lehman failed the following uh following September week. 08, right? So September- 08, yep. 08, yep. yeah. And it just so happened, right? That general growth properties had something like a $900 million mortgage on one of its Las Vegas properties that was coming due in September of 08. Mm-hmm. They could not refi that piece of paper. So they defaulted. Okay. Now, and with it, 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 put this in the backdrop of your mind, right around that same time, um, Circuit City, which was a competitor to Best Buy, a big box, you know, uh, retailer like uh, Best Buy, mm-hmm. was not only in chapter. 11, they were going to chapter seven, meaning liquidation, because there was no dip financing available, right? No debtor in possession financing available. Usually when companies go into chapter 11, a dip lender comes in and is able to give liquidity to the company in chapter 11 and helps them sort of uh, recuperate, right? Yep. When, there, when there's not even dip lending available, right? A lot of times companies just have no choice but to get liquidity. And that means it's, all of its assets get fire sold at sense on the dollar. And that's what happened in September 08 to Circuit City. So with all this in, in, in the background, right, and knowing what was happening uh, in, in the world and, you know, banks uh, getting bank runs, et cetera, general growth property uh, convertible bonds, they, they, these things gapped down to four cents on the dollar because pe- uh, the markets basically thought, holy shit, this company is going to wind up getting liquidated, you know, the equity is toast and um, it's got 25 billion of seniors secured above, you know, they're in deep trouble. We, at that point, you know, on, on my remaining convert our position, um, I, I had taken uh, some losses on it. Um, not big because we had already reduced our position, mm-hmm. but we, we basically thought, well, you know, what's interesting about this situation is that the, here's a company that is 
not like Circuit City, right? They, they, these guys are in the business of, of collecting rents. And not only that, but they're collecting rents in the highest uh, in, in basically like class A shopping malls, right? So even if um, you, they, their delinquencies uh, shot way up, these guys would be actually okay. And it wouldn't be a situation where there would, they would have to be you know, forced to liquidate into a vacuum. So we decided to build a naked long position in these convertible bonds at four cents on the dollar because we perceived that fu the fulcrum of the capital structure to be in the converse. Okay, so we bought a, a lot of these bonds at four cents on the dollar, thinking wow. that when, when, when things would return to normal, these things might be worth par. Well, the, the, let's fast forward to probably the late summer of 09, when, you know, mar markets are, you know, kind of healing after TARP, et cetera, right? Yep. So our, bond, our bonds started jumping. And at, at one point, and I want to say this might be fall of 09, the bonds uh, had jumped up to 70 cents on the dollar. We had made a killing on these bonds. But at that point, I noticed something very, very interesting. The, I, I told you that the, uh, uh, there was 25 billion of seniors secured. Then you had a billion and a half of converts now trading at 70 cents on the dollar. So call it a 1.1 billion of market value of debt, right? But the underlying equity market cap, I can't remember the exact number, but let's say it was, it had gone from near zero to back up to maybe half a billion dollars, right? Well, at this point, I'm thinking the fulcrum is actually jumping to the equity. You know, the, these bonds are likely going to be worth par, but the risk reward of staying long the bonds isn't as good as being in the equity. What if I shorted the bonds at 70 cents on the dollar and went dollar for dollar long, long the equity? If I shorted the bonds at 70 cents on the dollar, the most I could possibly lose is another 30 points, maybe, you know, maybe plus accrued interest, 30, call it 35 points, my max loss on the bonds, right? Mm -hmm. But if that happened, um, it will be, it will mean that we're in a world where this equity could potentially be like a five or six bagger. So so that, so that was phase two of our trade. We complete, we exited our, our bonds that we bought for four, sold them at 70 and then shorted the bonds at 70 and now went dollar for dollar long the equity. So you could call that almost like a reverse convert arm, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and then you fast forward, now we're probably into 2010. Um, Brookfield and Simon Property Group who are competitors mm -hmm. wound up getting into a bidding war to buy GGP. The stock wound up going from, I think when we bought it, it was maybe around, I don't know, three bucks or whatever. The stock got bid up to something like almost $17. Jeez. So we, we lost, we lost 35 points on our bond short, but we absolutely killed it on the equity. And, and, but, but, you know, we didn't, you know, buy the equity until, you know, we could have bought the equity as low as probably just mere cents per share, but we didn't because at that point, the better security in our mind was owning the bonds at four cents because that was clearly the fulcrum. We shifted our focus to the fulcrum when the fulcrum shifted down to the equity. And then, and, and then to finish this thought out, uh, the GGP might be my career winningest trade, if that's a word, because um, after, after it got bid up in, in this bidding war, um, we got out of the position, sat back for a while. And then and I think um, one of the bidders dropped out. The stock uh, fell back to around, I want to say, I think like 12 bucks or so. And at that point, you know, now we're into 2010. And we're in a completely different environment. You know, it's pretty clear that at 10 bucks a share, the stock was at 12 bucks a share, the stock was just a very cheap 
value equity relative to its peers. Yep. We, we figured that the stock at that point uh, only had maybe two bucks of fundamental downside. But what we did was we wound up reestablishing a position in the stock at around 12, 13 bucks a share. And then um, we bought put spreads on Simon property, which mm-hmm. was trading at a much uh, expense, much m- m- richer valuation. And in addition to that, this was 2010. That was the year that we also got back into convert ARB as an asset class. There were a whole bunch of other REIT convert ARBs that were cheap. So we had a no, we had a whole portfolio of REIT convert ARBs that provided sort of long gamma exposure to the asset class as another uh, way of embedding sort of you know puts uh, on the sector. So wow. that was that that was round three of the GGP saga, which we also did really, really well on. So that's what, I mean, that's what I, I used to do a lot is we could be involved in one capital structure over many, many years, but play it from many angles and, you know, flip things around, et cetera. So it's really uh-huh. fun. <laughs> sure is. And, you know, that's, that's sort of one of those trades, you know, unless, you know, you're really into sort of special sits or distress or that kind of investing, you don't really know. So, um, yeah. you know, do you have any other, you know, sort of good war stories from your days at, say, you know, Jay Aaron or, you know, the early days at Canyon, especially during, say, the Russian crisis or the dot-com bubble pop? Oh, so much. I mean, you know, um, let's see. Well, Jay, you know, Jay Aaron was a, uh, was a super interesting place to cut one's teeth, I guess. <laughs> kind of a uh, uh, pretty, very, very intense culture, um, mm-hmm. trial by fire. Um, so the the product um, that I was trading was the GSCI. So it was then a, a nascent product that was, you know, basically, you know, we had a futures contract that was listed at the Chicago Merck. Um, and, um, you know, the, the typical market liquidity was dominated just by the locals and the Merck trading, mm-hmm. you know, 10, 10 lots up. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I, as the upstairs trader at Goldman, my mandate was to make sure that no matter who came into that pit, I would provide unlimited liquidity. Um, and at my disposal, I could basically where I was situated, I could uh, utilize like our capability, J. Aaron's capabilities in oil and energy, our capabilities in grains, our, you know, my our relationships with meats, our relationships with, you know, coffee, cocoa, sugar, right? So if someone came in and wanted liquidity on 10,000 lots, which mm-hmm. basically happened in 1994, when the pension fund of a of a large corporation came in and decided they wanted to do that. I was in the center of this storm where what was a 10 lot up market became a 10,000 up, mar- up market. Wow. And that was incredible because I had to figure out a way to rapid fire hedge out 22 underlying commodities and and in so doing, right? We we had I was encouraged to take uh, proprietary trading views in pretty much everything under the sun, right? So, you know, sometimes I would say, let's say I got lifted on 10,000 lots of GSCI. And that means that, um, you know, I'd be short GSCI and then I would have to basically be long, you know, and buy all these other, other commodities, right? But sometimes there were certain commodities within the sector that I was very technically or fundamentally bearish on. So I might leave those unhedged, for instance. Um, another, another lesson that came out was uh, just being uh, street smart because our role, the, the way the contracts were rolled every month was a, was a very uh, broadly broadcasted methodology Mm-hmm. One that the locals knew and they were able to front run us. Um, and so especially in, in contracts with limited liquidity, like coffee, cocoa, live hogs, live cattle, right? We could really get screwed on the roll because the locals could see us coming from afar. 
So we had to devise all sorts of trading stratagems to try to outwit the locals. And so that, that was a lot of fun. So I, I, would, I, would, I would say that, you know, most of my sort of trading chops and trading street smarts came from those early days um, at J. Aaron. Um, the, the, um, and, and, you know, what's, what was also interesting is, you know, that desk back then was run by Lloyd Blankfein um, and Gary Cohn. Wow. So, you know, you, so yeah, definitely, definitely was a, uh, was a uh, fun place to learn. Um, the, when, so when I was at um, Canyon, yeah, I mean, um, 1998 kind of happened before I could even blink. I had just gotten there and I was still trying to figure things out. And so, um, uh, you know, Canyon at that point, um, got hurt in some of the, uh, in some of the Russian bonds. Um, but you know, I was still building, uh, my, my book out, my business out. So I was lucky from that standpoint that, you know, I didn't have an existing portfolio that might've gotten affected by the carnage, but perhaps the more interesting, um, um, story I can offer you from the, from the dot com bust is that I see a lot. Look, I see a lot of parallels of today's market setup to the to the to the months leading up to the dot com bust. And, and my biggest um, the, the dot com bust was a great time to be in in my strategy at that time because what you had was you had a period of extreme equity volatility without extreme credit volatility okay so if you think about it right that's the perfect setup for convertible arbitrage because the bond floors held up while the equities plummeted right um so i actually killed it in 2001 because of because of that um but the the what what i was gonna the parallel that i was gonna draw to today's market is that you know, there was so much FOMO driven behavior in those markets back then. Um, and y- y- to see all these B2B stocks, I don't know if you remember this guy, George Gilder. He used to subscribe to his newsletter. He was like the Mr. Telecosm. He's the guy extolling all the virtues of Metcalf's law and network effects and B2B and, you know, the, all the fiber optic companies, et cetera. Well, you know, all these companies were, a lot of these companies were basically floating two or three percent of their market caps in these, you know, highly, highly restricted IPOs, right? Where the supply was ex- made ext- extremely artificially inelastic, right? And you had these seductive paradigm shift demand narratives, kind of what you hear today in yep. the world of crypto, especially, right? extolling Metcalf's law, network effects, regime change, what have you, right? And then it all fell to pieces. And I, I something I always like to say is that the sword of inelastic supply cuts both ways. It's a very sharp sword and it cuts both ways because when you've got a supply curve that's near vertical, mm-hmm. even small shifts in the demand curve can mean very, very large price swings, right? And um, that's ultimately what happened. That's, so that's observation number one, similarity number one. Similarity, the observation number two from that era is that just like, um, you know, there, there were a lot of talks. There, were, there was a lot of talk about regime change and new paradigm shifts with, you know, B2B and, and et cetera, right? And, and there, there, were, there were these astronomical valuations accorded to a lot of what I would call sort of like layer one to layer three technologies, right? Stuff that, you know, like global crossing level three. I don't know if you even remember, recognize these names, but these guys were the purveyors of bandwidth, right? The JDS uniphase yep. phases of the world. These guys were the fiber optic providers, right? Um, it, it wasn't too long thereafter, 2001, that JDSU got a new moniker. And it was like, you know, right around 1999, it was called Just Don't Sell Us. <laughs> and, 
and then and then uh, everything changed. And so the observation is that the ultimate crucibles of value out of that era weren't these initial sort you know promises of you know endless bandwidth and you know uh, the 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 layer one technologies. It was the companies that were able to garner real cash flows. Uh, and make use of the technology that the internet provided, right? Mm -hmm. So in that same frame of mind, I guess it's my view that um, you, you have this current land grab in the world of crypto, and there's so much liquidity being funneled into cryptocurrencies. But what I, the problem I'm finding with that with it is that these these tokens mm -hmm. don't really have and an intrinsic value associated with them that you can use some sort of discounted cash flow framework to value. Yep. So my view is that ulti the ultimate crucibles of value out of this sort of second boom, if you will, is going to go to those companies that can actually use blockchain technology to disrupt existing verticals. And you know, it, history. I, I guess it remains. Uh, it remains to be seen what happens. But I, I, I do see a lot of rampant speculation, not just in crypto, but in, you know, in the meme stocks, um, spacs for a while. Um, I think th these are all symptoms of just way too much liquidity in the system. Yep. 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 Got it. <clears throat> And now, you know, I wanted to move and talk about something that you've become, you know, very well known for, and that is your thesis of you know, an oil super cycle that's going to happen so sort of like the next decade or so. So could you sort of give us a, your, a, a brief overview of your thesis for someone who might not be aware and, you know, for uh, to learn more about, you know, Michael's thesis and they could go check out a couple of, uh, you know, interviews that he's done on uh, Real Vision. And, you know, recently, I think it was just last week, uh, there was a, there was an interview released with you and Warren Pies, and I think that was spectacular. So, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> Well, I, well I, I, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. See, so, so the one thing I want to just caveat real quick is I think that the the name, the subtitle of that interview, why oil is about to enter a super cycle, not quite accurate. Because if you actually listen to the that interview with uh, with me and Warren, we both of us sort of discounted the the idea that we we held. I held that the idea that a super cycle uh, is possible, but Heavily caveated that, but with with saying that OPEC plus is also um, investing in spare capacity, right? So, look, I've I've been in in in, um, in the in the last several years of running my fund, I was I got heavily involved in in, in the energy space, um, uh, investing in the distress cycle of energy, right? And so, uh, as a matter of full disclosure, my only energy investment is through a post reorg equity of a restructuring that I participated in back in 2016. It's a private company, don't trade it. Um, and so as a result, I, I follow oil fundamentals very, very closely and have for a long time now. Um, and obviously, I, I had uh, original experience with uh, tracking oil uh, when I was on the GI desk, because you know the yep. oil and petroleum complex account for about fifty percent of the GSCI, at least it did back then. It's by mm -hmm. far the largest uh, commodity. So when people say uh, super cycle, they typically mean there. There are a lot of different connotations, but I would I would say that the most the prevalent connotation is that we're entering into some sort of structural cycle that's perhaps a decade in the making right where where um the lack of uh long cycle capex is going to create a situation where the spare capacity that opec currently has is going to get exhausted mm -hmm. and if that happens right and and if it happens in a in a way where shale is unable to respond very quickly, then then we we're we're gonna have a a potential flyaway scenario where oil could hit 
150, 200 bucks a barrel, right? Um, I think that is possible, but but it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky timeline because so you have to look at the 2024 to 25 period, I think, because, you know, I think back in maybe March or April, I wrote a thread that talked about hypothetically, if you look at, if you look at current spare capacity in the world between OPEC and non-OPEC sources, to be very, very, uh, you know, conservative, it's probably 11, about 10 million barrels per day. Mm -hmm. And back then when I wrote the thread, um, the global demand was at around 95 million barrels. We're, we've now sort of uh, recovered back up to around 98, but now with like recent uh, worries over Delta, we're now down into the 97 handle again, et cetera. But the idea is that by the end of 2022, most analysts that, that I follow think that demand recovery will be probably, will, will be back to around, will be past the uh, pre-COVID high and maybe be around 102, right? And so by certainly by 2024, um, demand should be probably right around that 105 uh, level. And so recall, when I wrote my thread, demand was at 95. So, and spare capacity was right around 10. So, at by 2024, if demand is 105 and there has been no new spare capacity built, we will be at that point, that very critical point where the world might run out of all spare capacity, right? Now, that is a possibility. However, um, I think in my in my, in, in my most um, recent thread around this conversation I had with Warren, I wrote that, you know, there, there have been inklings that um, the GCC countries, especially, right, especially Saudi Arabia, have been investing heavily um, in spare capacity. Yep. A lot of people, a lot of people don't really believe that. And, you know, you've, we've been hearing forever that, yeah, you know, the Dwar field is, aging, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, that the, the, the fact that they've been able to keep the curve backwardated, um, it, 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 allows, it, it allows them the ability to make investments at a time when shale can't really flex, right? Mm -hmm. Warren talked about the backwardation the curve being backwardated as a sort of market management tool. And that's something I wholeheartedly agree with because OPEC's strategy right now is to drain the OECD uh, supply inventories down to the safety stock level of 2.75 billion barrels, get it down to that level. So that way the, the curve stays backwardated and prices further out on the curve stay low. And so that's what my friend at Capital One um, calls supply insecurity, right? OPEC wants supply insecurity to keep the shale guys at bay. Mm -hmm. I will add one more thought, a new thought though. Delta, the, the, the fact that we now have worries over government responses to the Delta um, conflagration, um, means that in addition to supply insecurity, we now also have demand insecurity, right? And so demand insecurity not only envelops shale guys, it envelops everybody, including OPEC. Yep, so, yep. so I've seen in recent days, I've seen a bunch of analyses where, you know, supply, given the new OPEC agreement, supply is going to grow to this amount by a certain amount of time. I, I think that's kind of missing the point of what this OPEC agreement was meant to do. It's this OPEC agreement is meant to give them the flexibility to restore the lost production. But if Delta really puts a crimp on demand, I don't think they're going to just blindly 
go uh, and and produce full bore because they've seen what that does, right? Yep. You could just see negative thirty eight bucks a barrel back in April of twenty twenty to 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 see what that strategy would do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep, yep, yep. And you know another uh, and so um, one thing that you know people tend to argue as it comes to commodities in general and oil specifically is slowing demographics and that's sort of the difference now between uh, let's sort of the difference between now and what happened sort of in the mid two thousands because we saw the rise of China we saw some expanding demographics there so do you think that overall you know slowing demo or demographics you know actually make a difference to your thesis. Um, it 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 uh, it certainly can. Um, I think the the bigger concern. Um, I see. To me, me, the bigger concern is how much um, the how quickly the world is going to uh, go to EVs. And um, you know, I think I think a lot of the initial uh, expectations that you know EVs were going to take the overtake the world by storm. I think those were a little bit over optimistic. I, I think that um, you know, one a lot of people like to cite uh, you know China's adoption of EVs is, um, as you know as like a you know a big sign for why you know the we're going to see peak oil demand. Not so much the demographic issue, but but uh, the more more the EV adoption issue. Yep. Um, the, 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 the problem with that thesis I see is that, um, you know, the, well, first of all, they've been, they've been falling short of their targets mm -hmm. and, and China's, you know, focus on EVs is kind of a sideshow relative to, you know, it's overall um, energy use, right? There, there was another um, thread I wrote a while ago about how I think, um, you know, China's EV, um, sorry, China's gasoline usage as a part of its, as a percentage of its overall um, energy use uh, is significantly lower uh, than the U.S. Um, and, and because, and it's mainly because they're, um, sorry, so actually, no, I, I misspoke. Um, let me, I'm not really answering your demographic um, problem because I just don't know the answer to that part. Okay, got it, got it. And um, yeah. so, you know, well, one more thing that I wanted to ask you is, you know, sort of the EU has introduced this sort of fit for 55, you know, carbon emission trading scheme and, you know, their uh, carbon emission futures are actually up like 200% or something over the last one and a half years so so what are your thoughts on that what are your thoughts on sort of this future price levy on fossil fuels going forward well i mean i think well <laughs> i don't know if you want to get me started on the whole climate change thing because you know the the um i, I think this Go ahead. mass <laughs> i think i think you know I, I wrote a thread about about this a while back and i basically and i wrote a long blog blog post uh, last year. Um, I think that the, a lot of the ESG um, movement um, is predicated upon solving the wrong variable. Um, I think I'm, I'm all for a clean planet. I'm all for less pollution, but there is a misnomer that um, there's a misunderstanding that CO2 is a pollutant. It is not. Right, CO two is is fundamentally required for photosynthesis, and the other thing is that CO two, even though there is, um, you know, there there global warming is happening, um, based upon the research that I've done and the interviews that I've conducted with, for instance, uh, you know, Professor Gigengak, who's chair emeritus of UPenn's um, Earth Sciences Department they'll tell you that we're barking up the wrong, wrong tree. And I quote that, I quote Professor Gingagak uh, uh, directly because there, there are literally hundreds of variables that impact uh, global temperatures. And one of the problems with the entire ESG movement is that it tends to focus on 
this famous hockey stick chart that was produced by Michael Mann of Penn State. And, and there's a really, really good book, if you ever want to read about it, uh, that goes into his statistical methods. It's called The Hockey Stick Illusion. And it talks about how he effectively eliminated this entire period called the medieval warming period uh, by using a statistical method that overweighted uh, near-term history versus uh, past cycles mm -hmm. uh, to basically accentuate the post-industrial warming that we've experienced and de-emphasize the past periods of of uh, you know very high uh, you know high temperature global temperatures, so um, I'm I'm very concerned. Um, but I, that's all. This is also a reason why I'm very I am structurally bullish uh, oil because I think these um, schemes to limit fossil fuels are going to uh, I, I guess discourage investment in this area and um, potentially cause that super cycle that we're talking about, right? Because the way that super cycle happens is exactly through continued um, capital starvation, especially the long cycle uh, capital starvation. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that there, the, the, what we should be doing um, on the ESG front is focusing on how to make um, fossil fuels cleaner, how to deal with thing, natural disasters more effectively, like, you know, fires and floods. Um, but these are, but solving for CO2 is not even the right variable to solve for. Because if you look at the long-term R square of CO2 to temperatures, it's, it's a very, very weak uh, link. Got it, got it. And, you know, uh, to, yeah, to stay on the topic of, you know, the oil super cycle, how are you actually thinking about, you know, playing this? And, of course, it's not, it's not investment advice. And, you know, as you mentioned, you had a position in a private restructuring. But... You know, well, so for example, Harris Kupperman, who's a well-known investor and who's also who also has a similar view um, on oil, has argued that you know owning oil producers and um, oil companies in general would not actually be you know the dominant trade because or the best trade simply because you know um, the uh, simply because he he thinks that we're going to see increased regulation of of oil companies and you know while oil goes up in price you know these companies may not profit as much because you know number one they're going to be regulated a lot more and number two you know the governments um seem to be you know hell-bent on helping these esg companies uh, you know become more profitable and become more you know sustainable from a company standpoint so how are you thinking about you know playing this would you would you just go straight up you know along the belly of the curve so 20 20, 2023, 2024, uh, you know, futures, or how are you thinking about that? I'll throw, look, I'll, th I'll throw another wrench in there, right? So the, the you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that I've learned from the School of Hard Knocks that this sector is not for the faint of heart. It is very, very difficult to get it right because you could get, you could do all the micro analysis you want on a company's capital structure and how it's fundamentally cheap and get the macro wrong, get blown out of the water, or you could get the macro uh, right, right? And then you have issues where with terrible capital reallocation. My biggest problem in this sector has been terrible, terrible capital, mis uh, capital reallocation. So what I mean by that is, let's take a, uh, a shale company XYZ, right? They've got a bunch of, acreage that they need to drill and um but but it's a constant hamster wheel of capex right because as they as they start producing as you know shale whales have a very very steep decline curve like within the first 18 months you basically see like a 70 percent drop in you know uh, initial production and then before it starts you know asymptoting out right so so what they what that means is that 
the free cash flow is very often ephemeral, especially if definitionally you're redeploying that free cash flow back into to the ground in definitionally worse acreage, right? Because yep. not all your acreage is going to be tier one. So in fact, one of the problems that I have with the shale space generally mm-hmm. is that um, now that we have essentially done all this high grading, right? Tier one is, tier. the current tier one was the old tier two or maybe even the old tier three, right? Um, and and so, so capital uh, reallocation, location there was a period in time before obviously oil ran up there's when oil was still in the doldrums you had uh these companies that were trading uh well below their their pv10 levels right so pv10 is sort of the industry standard metric for valuing the reserves so you would think that you know the the reserve value is what we distressed investors call like a blowdown value in other words if you basically just stopped stopped Every, all new activity and essentially just like sort of harvested the asset, the, the existing asset and let it kind of like li- self-liquidate, right? Mm-hmm. Your PV10 value ought to be your theoretical floor. But the reason why these companies were trading at discounts to PV10 is because of that terrible capital reallocation risk, right? Because companies wind up destroying value over and above what their PV10 value is. And so the reason why I, I've decided to to not uh, actively participate in the public EMP space and just rather be in, in this private uh, private company is that in our private company, we have a mandate. Our mandate is we have this great piece of acreage in the Permian Basin. We are going to fully develop it and we're not going to plow that money back into the ground. Okay, so so that is a key differentiating strategy, and that's that's what I like. Now, to the um, average investor that might not have access to that, well, there are you you can look if you're investing in the in the public space, um, you know you there are various ETFs that you could play, right? Um, or, but but the the ETFs are are various. You know, you have the XOP ETF, you have the OIA ETF, you can play different sectors, right? Um, There's a case to be made for why a pure play in the commodity might actually be better Mm -hmm. because the, the commodity, by investing in the commodity, you're stripping yourself of a lot of the, the capital reallocation issues you're stripping yourself of capital structure risks, right? And you're gaining the roll yield of the backward-aided curve, right? So the roll yield, or at Goldman, we call it a convenience yield, is that when you have a curve where spot trades at a pretty big premium to forward prices, by owning forwards, say, six to 12 months out and just holding it, you wind up earning a yield as it sort of matures to spot. As as long as you believe that OPEC is going to continue to engineer this dynamic, that that, that, this dynamic of short-term supply inelasticity coupled with longer-term supply insecurity. That is the dynamic that OPEC wants. Now, there is one sector of the market that benefits from that. It's not the shale guys. It's actually the um, uh, the mineral the minerals guys, right? So again, I'm not gonna I'm I'm, I'm leery of giving specific names, mm-hmm. but the the minerals plays are companies that are basically just they don't hedge typically and they just they they basically just pay out what their what the production is of under the underlying you know minerals um stakes that they own right so if you think about it if if you want a domestic play on oil that benefits from the oil curve in the same way opec benefits 
then it's the, the purest play, I think, is through the minerals. <clears throat> yep, yep, got it, got it. Any last thoughts, Michael, before we wrap up the interview? Yeah, I, this, is, this is fun. You, uh, you know, uh, 